Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Altmetric webinar. Um, we're just going to give people a few more seconds to join. Uh, we've got a lovely number of people registered, and we'd like to get as many of them in as we can. So we'll get started in just a minute. And hopefully you can all see my screen okay here. Yeah. Trying to find full screen, but we'll stick with this. Okay, I think we'll get started. So welcome to today's webinar. Um, could one of the panelists just tell me that you can see my screen and the slides okay? Yes, I can, Kat. Yes. Perfect, thank you. So welcome to Effective Social Media Strategies for Publishers. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. If you do have any questions throughout the webinar, please just pop them in the question box. Um, we will get to them at the end of the session. Let us know if you can't hear or see, and we'll do what we can to help you out. Um, and this webinar is being recorded, so if you miss anything or if you want to share it with any colleagues afterwards, um, we'll be sending a link around in our follow-up email. So our speakers today, um, hello, I'm Kat, I run the marketing at Altmetric. Um, joining me on the webinar are Phaedra Cress uh, from the ASJ, Steve Dudley from the British, and Steve Dudley from the British Ornithologist Union. And today we'll cover a quick introduction to publishers and how they've been using social media to date. Um, Phaedra will take a closer look at using social media at the Aesthetic Surgery Journal, um, Steve will share his study of the tweeting bird, uh, looking at social media to support an author community. Um, and then, like I said, we'll have time for questions at the end. So where are we today? Um, many of you, of course, will be aware, and I'm sure experiencing these for yourselves, um, there are growing challenges for publishers. There's increasing competition to try and get your content seen and read with the huge volume of journals and articles and, and books and chapters that are being produced all the time. Um, also, there's this big strive to add value for readers, authors, and subscribers. Um, and particularly as more and more content uh, is going open access, attracting and keeping the best authors is becoming more important for your businesses. Making informed business decisions, so about the journals or the content or the special issues that you deliver, um, is becoming increasingly critical in terms of making sure that you've got the content that people really want to read and that's really on topic. Uh, at the same time, you're competing for shrinking uh, institutional budgets, which I think is always an ongoing challenge, um, but also to align your goals as a publisher or as a business with those of the wider scholarly community. And of course, authors have plenty of challenges that they're facing too. Um, they're also trying to get their work seen and read. Um, but increasingly, they're being asked to evidence the broader reach and influence that that work is having. They need to try and prioritize what to read out of everything that's available out there. They need to make the most informed decision they can about where to publish their work, whilst at the same time trying to attract new funding or even find new collaborators to work with wherever they might be in the world. And a lot of the um, challenges that perhaps authors are finding themselves coming up against are driven by really what the funders are asking for. And certainly in the last 10 years or so, there's been a really big push from funders for authors to not just show what they've published and the academic impact that it's had, but really how it's reached a broader audience um, and how they've received it and what actual real world impact it's had. So with Altmetrics, of course, what we're really talking about is helping them to showcase that broader attention, so to find it, um, to help you as publishers track it so you can see what's going on. So we really pull together that academic and that wider engagement so you get a much more complete picture of what's happening around um, a, an article, a book, a chapter. Um, so whether it's mentions in policy, mentions on Wikipedia, uh, mentions perhaps in open syllabi where it's been featured on reading lists, for example, all of these things can help you understand where your content has been shared and why people are talking about it. 
So what does all of this mean for how we actually communicate research? Well, if we think about a typical timeline of attention, uh, whereas before maybe something would be published in a journal and then it would take a few months or even a few years before it gets cited, now we see attention occurring much sooner after publication. Um, you can see on this graph, typically even within hours of the research being published online, we'll see some tweets appear, we might see some news outlets pick up the research, particularly if the publisher has done a big push on these two channels. Um, and then over time you'll see other people starting to share it on different social channels. People might write blogs about it. Eventually, of course, it might make its way onto those reading lists that we talked about, um, or even be cited in public policy or added to somewhere like Wikipedia. So the way that this research is communicated and the speed at which it's disseminated has changed rapidly. And it's really aware that you're, it's really important that you're engaged with what's going on here. Um, Particularly over the last five years, we've really seen the academic use of social media growing as well. If you look at the graph on the left here, uh, this shows the Twitter attention that we had in the Altmetric database. So this is mentions on Twitter of academic research. Um, and you can see over the four year period that we did our little study over here, it's grown rapidly. Um, but more importantly, the actual um, mentions of research on Twitter have grown much faster than we would proportionally expect them to for the rate at which the Twitter user base is growing. So it's a really good example to see, you know, it's not just that more people are using Twitter, it's that more people are actively talking about research on Twitter. Um, and then you've got people like the Times Higher Education coming out with guides for how researchers can use social media. There's a really big trend now for, to getting out there and talking about your work with these wider audiences. From our own experience at Altmetric, um, there's tips and tricks of how to promote your research successfully online. It was a blog post that we wrote two years ago, and every month we check, and almost every month it is still at the top of our reading lists. Um, so this is clearly what researchers are out there looking for. Um, and of course, it's not just researchers who are adapting. Many publishers are already doing things in this space. You go to any publisher website these days, I've, I've picked the Genetic Society of America here, um, and you'll see the social share icons, the places to follow them on the social networks that they're active on. Sage, for example, have a really nice page where they give some tips for authors on how they can increase uh, the usage and the citations to their research. Um, Duke have got a really great Facebook presence um, where they are actually sharing some top lists of the most mentioned or the most read articles from some of their journals. Um, and then people like Wiley, of course, and many publishers will do this now make it really easy to share individual articles via a huge variety of social networks. So almost whether or not you're engaged or not, there will be people out there talking about your work and the content that you're publishing. And, you know, it's not just social sharing. This new way of communicating research provides some really exciting opportunities for publishers as well. Whole new ways to highlight really interesting content to engage your audiences. Um, you can see Nature, of course, on, on some of their journals, they have their top altmetric lists. Um, but also people like Liverpool University Press, who've done this really nice little pull-out bit here where they're saying, you know, what is the community that you're a part of actually talking about? Because that's what altmetrics really show, you know, they're not just numbers and, and these random faces that you never come across. They're actually people who work in the same research area that you do much of the time. Um, Cambridge have a page that showcases their most influential articles. Um, and the uh, Australian Journal of Management here, again, have a nice uh, Twitter post here where they are sharing a list via Twitter of the articles that have received the most attention. So just really interesting ways to pull out specific parts of your content that, that people might like to delve into. So what difference does this all make? Um, well, there are various studies that discuss and debate the impact of sharing research on social. Um, the majority agree that sharing it there certainly makes it more visible. Um, the real world impacts are often debated um, and the approach that we certainly take at Altmetric is, um, you know, people certainly can't use your work if they don't know it's there. So anything that you can do to make it more visible is a good thing. Um, the extent to which uh, you would consider perhaps public engagement and impact is completely down to the type of research that you do um, and really what you're trying to achieve with it. Um, this 2013 PLOS study that you can see the graph from here uh, found that, of course, once research had been shared on social media compared to research that hadn't, um, the, the views it got per day went up dramatically. 
Um, others have questioned, uh, you know, do what metrics work? Uh, Twitter and 10 other social web services. Um, but again, it really comes down to what are you trying to measure? Alt metrics help you measure the reach and the engagement of the work. They don't necessarily tell you exactly what impact it is having in the real world. Um, but really nicely here at the bottom, there's this Medium article um, that talks about how using social media and open access, of course, an important factor in all of this, can really help improve the visibility of even just chapters in books. So not, not even necessarily talking about promoting the whole book or the whole journal, but really picking out those individual pieces of interesting content. Um, and what does all of this give you as a publisher? Um, well, certainly instant feedback on your work. You know, if you're out there on social networks talking about it, you'll be able to see what people say. Um, and all metrics, of course, can really help you do this. It also gives you the ability to demonstrate your commitment to the community, um, that you're not just there publishing in a silo, um, you know, producing more and more content that no one is really engaging with. Uh, by using social media, you can really get in there and talk to the people who are using your work. Um, the opportunity to grow author engagement. Um, so we see an increasing number of kind of author chats taking place on Twitter or on Facebook. Um, it can give you some nice tools to talk to them about. And it can really show that, you know, you are there to support them beyond just publishing uh, a PDF. Um, and of course, improving the visibility. We've done a couple of surveys and so have some of our publishing partners. Um, in one of them that we did, uh, which looked in detail at arts and humanities authors, um, over 80% of them said they were already sharing their research online. Uh, so even if you're not on there sharing their research, they certainly are, um, and it's where you can find them. Um, and then in a Wiley survey, 50% of the authors that they questioned said they were more likely to submit a paper to a journal that supports alt metrics um, and really kind of by extension, you know, shows an awareness of that social space and of, of the importance of understanding those bigger conversations. Um, and it's not just for your authors, of course, you can use all of this data internally to help inform your editorial decisions, to really demonstrate the uh, relevance of the publications that you have to institutions or to authors, um, to increase the effectiveness of marketing activity. So you can see uh, where your press release is being picked up, you can understand what tweets really resonate with your audiences, um, and just to understand and engage with a broader audience. So if you're trying to find reviewers or perhaps looking for new editorial board members, for example, social media can be a really great place to start looking for them. I will stop wittering on now so that you can hear from some real experts. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn off my camera um, and I will hand over to Phaedra, who's going to present on their experience. Uh, Phaedra, I'll just hand it over to you now. Let me just find you in this big list. There we go. Okay, let me know if you can hear me okay, Kat. Yeah, I can hear you perfectly. You just need to share your screen so we can see your slides. Perfect. All right, are and we good? The moment we can see kind of the presenter view. Okay. All right, so we're good? Uh, we can still see where you would have your speaker notes. I'm not sure if that's what you wanted to show. Let me see here. Okay, how's that? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, perfect. Okay, well, thanks, Kat. It's an honor to be here, and I appreciate the invitation to participate, especially on International Women's Day. So today I'll be talking about the importance of social media and alt metrics in publishing. I was asked to discuss how I learned about alt metrics and when, and I have to give credit where it's due. Rachel Burley, with whom I worked at Wiley, was among the first to become involved in alt metrics. She lectured and held town hall meetings in which she espoused the importance of this new technology right around the time it was emerging. She's a well-respected voice in our field, and I was immediately intrigued. And then I met Betsy Donahue of Digital Science at a COPE meeting a couple of years ago, and we clicked, and I became an ambassador for Altmetric. So my own interest in combination with these relationships landed me a spot on this map here in North America, specifically in New Jersey, where I live and work. So this was the state of affairs in 2014. Altmetrics was new to our journal, the Aesthetic Surgery Journal, and our alt, uh, top altmetric score was 17 on a cool sculpting article by renowned plastic surgeon, Dr. Grant Stevens, and we thought that was a pretty high score at the time. So we're pretty proud of ourselves. So 
I launched our Twitter site on the day I began my role at ASJ in April of 2014. And I'll admit I was a little surprised that we had not already jumped in. We were using Facebook, but posting sporadically at best, and we had a low follower base. Our followers have grown because our editorial team has worked tirelessly toward this end. And these numbers may not seem huge by comparison to some, such as a few of the top plastic surgeons in our field who tout 150,000 plus followers, but as we've just learned, Twitter's cracking down on users with fake followers. So we've seen some reductions in these huge volumes as recently as just a week or two ago. As an academic journal, we strive to continuously improve and we don't delude ourselves that someday we'll have a million followers. There are fewer than 7,000 board certified plastic surgeons in the US, so we're close to capturing most of them by our count. What this means is there's room for international growth and that's a market that we pursue. Because attention spans are shrinking, we're also heavily involved in creating videos and sharing on YouTube, perhaps not the first medium that you would think about in a social media conversation, but we found it useful in driving traffic back to our website, and videos can also have a positive effect on usage stats. We have a presence on LinkedIn as well, but it's not our first go-to for posts, and we're also dipping a toe in with Instagram, something that we haven't used much in the past because of some logistics issues. But now that Insta has evolved technically, we realize it's time to engage with millennials in a format that's really trending for them right now. In 2016, this was hands down our highest altmetric score. The article had broad appeal because the research studied the effect of a surgeon's choice on music and the resulting effects on suture closure rates. So a couple years later, we went from 17 to 399 and the national media jumping on board and paying attention to this article really helped us with uh, getting a high score. So the million dollar question, what's in it for me? And I don't presume to have all the answers, but I will share my opinions with you. How much time and resources should you invest in social media? And what's the yardstick by which you measure your returns? Return on investment can be elusive and it's measured differently from industry to industry. This marketing company quotes an ROI of 92% with a 50% increase sales in sales rate because of social media use. So we all know that academia and publishing are not measured by a bean counter and we're not selling widgets here. So one way that we measure ROI is usage or link backs to journal websites. So this is a tangible, me tangible mechanism by which you can calculate annual increases from specific referrers such as Facebook or Twitter. And that's something that we pay attention to year over year. Consistency of voice is essential in social media. Having one dedicated person or a team who works symbiotically can really make your messaging look and feel familiar to your followers and help them to want to keep coming back for more. Dog-Eared Social used this helpful analogy that I really liked. Think of social media as a networking event and the website traffic as the coffee date that follows. You recruit on social and you sell on your website. So social really does touch all that we do. And this slide is repurposed from a talk I gave a few weeks ago in Huntington Beach, California. It was intended to encompass a few of the achievements of our journal. In preparing for today's talk, it dawned on me that every single item listed here is linked together through social media as a vehicle by which we develop, promote, and create. Visual abstracts, which you'll see in the lower left here, are used to promote academic content in a snapshot so readers can quickly glean whether it's worth their time and investment to read the full article. We use social media to tweet and post about new articles, of course, like many of you I'm sure are doing, and that draws attention to them and also helps to organically increase altmetric scores. Just about every new innovation we've seen is first promoted via social media simply by virtue of the fact that social media affords us that great speed. From adding Twitter handles to the corresponding author section to our Cosmetic Corner video series, which posts on YouTube and is tweeted broadly through social media, um, these are all a common thread. I'm privileged to have the opportunity to write about things that interest me, both for the Aesthetic Surgery Journal and on various blogs such as The Scholarly Kitchen. This past November, I put together a few thoughts about altmetrics, their relevance, and why I find them essential. 
It's an update of sorts to an article I published in ASJ in 2014 on all metrics, shown to the right here. I've included a couple of links if you want to take a look at these. The ASJ article has been cited 18 times according to Google Scholar, and that's probably be probably because it was among the first batch of articles to really describe alt metrics. So we know alt metrics have been around for eight years now, and it's grown and evolved in this short time from relative obscurity to nearly a household name for those of us who are following publishing trends. It's rare in any, in my experience anyway, to attend any publishing oriented conference today where alt metrics is not discussed or presented. So what's your strategy? We talk a lot about strategy and defining goals, reviewing metrics. This is really crucial. Having your goals and milestones mapped out in advance uh, is, is a really important uh, facet of planning and also a mechanism by which to truly analyze your metrics. With the support of our publisher, which is Oxford, Oxford University Press, we found that our best time to post is Tuesdays or Wednesdays from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So little things like this, having this information and being thoughtful about the programs that you use to tee up your messages, which could be Hootsuite or TweetDeck, that really gives you an advantage over sharing content at times when your audience might be less likely to engage with it. So how do you measure the conversion rate, sales or customers that come in as a direct result of your social media efforts? Like everything, this takes time and resources. And many of the plastic surgeons we work with um, capture that information uh, on intake forms when uh, clients come into the office. We began capturing Twitter handles during peer review. So if an article is accepted, we can go ahead and tag the authors and engage with them. It's little things like this that can really make a big difference. And as Kat mentioned, show that you've got a commitment to authors, their research, and really having it um, viewed and seen much more broadly. So I know knowing your target audience is not news to anyone, but we really try to work hard to avoid putting our audience asleep. Uh, we share valuable and meaningful content. We try not to use that used car salesman approach. Um, we always uh, you know, encourage people to use has hashtags and create lists when appropriate. And remember that what's right for Twitter might need to be adapted for other mediums. So you just need to find the right fit. Social media definitely isn't a one size fits all. We work hard to connect and engage with those that we wouldn't normally have access to, especially our global followers. So at conferences and other times when social media uh, can happen in real time, that helps to solidify relationships and also networking. And as you can see here, some of the potential returns on those investments are finding new authors for your journal, submissions, reviewers, which we're always all looking for. And then, you know, more financial based things such as uh, potential special projects, advertising and supplement sales. And then of course, uh, connecting people. Networking is hugely important and a good uh, takeaway and result from social media. So, after four years, most of our editors now do understand and know alt metrics. Uh, we, fair, we share a fair amount of content on alt metrics and via social media. We have written editorials. We presented at our annual meeting and board meetings. We created a video series around it. But there's still a few, and this might be generational, who don't understand. And five or ten years from now, I don't think that will be the case. Um, we found that some people still think and look at Facebook as it's an area to you know, a social media uh, where I post photos of my grandchildren. So like anything, there might be learning curves and that's something to remain cognizant of in, in your own fields. Twitter happens in real time and we all know those people who retweet us within seconds and then others who we tag and it takes a week for them to even notice. So, you know, knowing your audience, knowing who's going to be more responsive and who engages with you regularly is definitely something to keep an eye on. Uh, though we found that Twitter can be more fun, we've seen a lower ROI on Twitter than we have from Facebook in terms of redirects to our journal homepage and therefore our downloads. So that's something that we've uh, turned our focus away a little bit from Twitter to Facebook. So analyzing your metrics to determine where you're seeing the greatest ROI and then focusing your resources there is important. Altmetric does not claim that attention equals citations, but could it? If you subscribe to the proverb that any press is good press, having your article mentioned is always a good thing. But is all press good press? 
I like to use this example, which some of you may have seen before from the journal Ethology in 2014. It's a great example of an, of an article that has a high altmetric score. It's 1911. And that's only because, well, people love a good story. And this is a classic one. Somehow the phrase, should we cite the crappy Gabor paper here, made it all the way through peer review, copy editing, typesetting, author and, and editorial review to publication. So is this a landmark paper because it has a high altmetric score? Probably not. But to put this in perspective, on Altmetrics Top 100 list in 2017, their highest score was 5,876. Their number 100 article was 1,891. So this is higher. It ranked higher. But there's only been six scholarly citations to this article. So it's food for thought when we think about citations versus attention. This is a photo of our editor at a recent meeting in California. And uh, we do a lot to educate our inner circle, our editorial boards. You're probably uh, doing a lot of the same types of things. Social media is part and parcel of modern publishing, and it's tangential to so many of the things that we do in our initiatives. So it's something that we not only strive to educate ourselves about, but to take the time to share our industry knowledge and updates with our board whenever we feel there's something uh, worthy of updating them on. We've held peer review short courses and incorporated social media and all metric training. And we write regularly about topics such as open access, predatory publishing, artificial intelligence. And we try to keep a focus on our top citations and downloaded articles. And we keep our board abreast of these activities and also our, our successes. So explaining the benefits of what we do and how we do it is a great way to encourage editors and authors to take action and get involved and also to become more interested and start to use social media more regularly for the benefit of the journal, their work, and of course, in our particular specialty, our patients. So there are some DIY resources, and we developed one that's called an author resource guide. And um, you know, there are things that you can be doing by yourself as an author. So this is a practical mechanism for promoting authors' newly published work. And uh, we send this out every time an author, uh, an article is published. And on the second and third pages, we have a shout out there to Altmetrics explaining, uh, you know, their value in terms of supplement to impact factor and a real-time way to reach a broader audience. So again, this guide goes out every time a new article in ASJ is published, and it's a way to encourage them to engage and follow on social media. We found that millennials are very active, hyperactive even, but older generations, 50, 60 years old and up, show a dip in uptake, interest in, and acumen. So I'm sure this is familiar to what you're seeing in your specialties as well. So after we train and teach, we ask them to tell us what they've got and to put social media to work. Uh, we show them methodologies for how they can uh, grow their networks. And we remind them that this is not something that you set up and walk away from. You do need to engage, nurture daily, try to be kind and retweet, uh, especially when people are engaging with you. And, you know, the importance of always responding. So one of the favorite stories I tell is that when I've had a conversation with someone at a, you know, at a meeting about social media or alt metrics, I give them a little tip or a trick and they come running up to me the next time they see me, uh, letting me know that they've had some great success with social media or a high alt metric score on an article or their number of followers has grown. And, you know, those are, you know, it's really fun to, to watch people get engaged and, and then to see what the ripple effect looks like. So our involvement with Altmetric, the company, and the scores for our article content has really, you know, helped us to keep up to date with this technology, which we truly believe complements more traditional metrics such as impact factor. It's a new solution for real-time feedback to authors and editors who choose to accept and publish their work. So we're proud to be leaders in social media, primarily because of the opportunities that it affords our followers to connect and find mentors, which is vastly important in plastic surgery. Before social media, junior doctors and researchers would never have had a mechanism by which they can chat in real time with someone they hold in such high esteem, let alone to have a meaningful conversation. So because of the combination of social media and publishing high quality medical and scientific articles, it gives them footing or an icebreaker, if you will, to do that. So the concept that our quality articles and technology help people connect and thrive make us proud to be part of the social media 
and altmetric movement in scientific publishing. And to take my own advice, um, I'm showing my human side. These pictures are from just about four hours ago. We had a big snowstorm here in New Jersey, so I wasn't able to get my morning run in. So uh, my running partner and I did a little snowshoeing and um, I wanted to uh, share those with you. So thanks for your time and attention and I'll turn it back over to Kat. Oh, lovely pictures. Thanks, Phaedra. Um, that was a really interesting presentation and I hope um, people got a, a lot of insight there and some good ideas from it. Um, if you do have any questions, please just pop them in the question box. We're looking forward to um, getting through all those at the end. Uh, right, now I will hand over to Steve. Uh, so Steve, a box should pop up in a moment. There we go. And then if you can just share your screen. Not sure Perfect. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Hi, everybody from Peterborough here in the UK. And thank you, Cat and Outmetric, for the invitation today. Um, both Cat and Phaedra have done a, a fabulous job in setting the scene for me um, as a small society. Um, I've just spent myself, my time nodding through Phaedra's talk in particular. Um, that's pretty much everything that we try to achieve for ourselves as a, a small society working within um, avian bird research. So I'm going to focus um, on in particular using social media to drive the visibility of your community and your author's um, research articles and it's going to include um, some of the research that myself and colleagues did um, around linking um, the visibility um, on social media um, linked to our metrics and through to citations of ornithological research articles. So if we set the scene just to show you who we are, the British Ornithologist Union or the BOU, we're a very small learned society here in, here in the UK with a worldwide membership of just over a thousand. And we publish um, a relatively low impact factor journal called IBIS, um, but we are at the top end of our stream of 24 journals, um, ranked usually one, two or three um, in any given year. We came onto social media in 2011, um, firstly on Twitter. Um, how we got here was quite interesting. Um, we, no one within the BOU knew anything about uh, social media. None of us were personal users. So in our annual publishing meeting with Wiley, I asked if they could um, find somebody to give us a few minutes on the benefits of using social media uh, to promote your journal. Um, they're duly obliged. And um, we had a, an hour long presentation during which both my ears were burning and my eyes were popping out. And I realized that this was actually uh, exactly the sort of medium that we actually needed to use ourselves. So in 2011, um, we went on to Twitter. We've now got over 12,000 followers. Um, we're on Facebook with just over 4,500 people following our page. And last year, we moved on to Instagram, which is apparently the uh, fastest growing science social media platform. And at the end of the year, we also went on to the Chinese platform of Weibo. So we use social media, like many societies, to promote our key activities, which of course is here in this instance, it's journals. Uh, we run conferences and we also run funding schemes. We promote wider ornithology. Um, we're the only society on social media that promotes beyond its own society. So we promote anything around the world, regardless of source. And importantly, um, we use social media to educate our community and that includes how to promote uh, research. So we've educated our community about our metrics. So when our metrics came online globally in 2014, um, we had a blog, um, I think it was June 2014, that, that our journal um, went into our metric. Um, and we had a blog up by the end of that month um, to educate our author community about, uh, about what our metrics were. Um, and the benefits of uh, using social media to promote their research in order to contribute to their outmetric score. So we tell them how to promote the research, we tell them where to promote the research, and we tell them which platforms are best to use. We, have, we principally drive a lot of this via a blog. Um, using your static site for, for static um, 
information and you drive all the, the, the users from your social media to your static site, just exactly as Phaedra said earlier. Um, so we do a lot of that and we have a massive um, amount of traffic moving between our social platforms and our website. So as you can see here, the, first, the, the earlier slide there was um, Twitter Masterclass. We're up to Twitter Masterclass 14. Um, we've, we've done things like What is Out Metric, and we've also um, encouraged people to learn about um, search engine optimization. So what we attempt to do here, we provide a one-stop shop so that we have one location that our community members can come to for any available content. And most of this stuff is, is widely available on the net. But by having it on one platform that they're they're familiar with and a website that they're familiar with, they don't have to go looking for it. They just wait for a tweet or a Facebook or an Instagram post from us, and then they go to the content. But before you actually embark on um, trying to build any of this for yourself, you've got to you've got to ask yourself some questions. These include: What are your aims as a journal or as a society? What does your community actually want from you as a journal or society? Have you got any evidence to support what you want to do and what your community wants? And lastly, how are you going to deliver those results or the messages around that evidence in order to engage with the community? So <clears throat> we'll start here by why use Twitter. Now, there's increasing evidence that shows that Twitter is becoming increasingly relevant for researchers and not just to promote their research, but to en engage with the wider public peer to peer uh, communications. And this paper by Ortega was published last year. And this showed you this shows that um, journals with their own Twitter accounts perform better both on Twitter itself and importantly on citations than journals that either have an owner account, a publisher account, and clearly with no account. Um, so that was re really an interesting piece of work um, to know that as a society and as, as a publishing society what we're actually doing is actually making sense and we actually see this in a similar way <clears throat> and we can demonstrate this so since the beginning of this year um, we published 23 papers in our journal our publisher has tweeted four times around some of those papers but we ourselves have tweeted 62 times so this shows you that we as a society a publishing society are actually driving the social media activity and the social media presence and visibility of our own research articles. And we've known for we know from our own research that um, we can actually contribute up to 82% of our journals overall out metric attention score. And that's just from that's just from Twitter. <clears throat> so if we continue some of the research that we've done into our own logical community, um, a paper that um, I published with two colleagues, Tom Finch and Nina O'Hanlon, last year um, in the Royal Society's Open Science. Um, we did a study of the 10 top ornithological journals, which also all happen to be small society journals. We looked at neat, just over uh, two and a half thousand research articles and we measured the altmetric attention score of all those articles published between 2012 and 2014. So that's basically two years before our metric became uh, online and two years afterwards. From that research, the, one of the first findings that we got was that Twitter was providing 73% of the overall Outmetric attention score for all of these journals. So Twitter is clearly driving the conversation in ornithology. We've got a small take up with um, Facebook. We've got a little bit more with blogs. And obviously, news is always a, a good um, scoring factor for art metrics. So authors can clearly contribute to the social platforms, but they, are, they have absolutely no influence of getting their articles covered by the news platforms. So authors themselves, and I know some authors have tried to get onto news platforms, and they really are best just leaving that alone and concentrating on the social platforms. So as a society, we ourselves encourage authors to use the platforms that we can actually demonstrate are going to be best for their, their communities, our metrics. So if we look at the example of the top scoring paper in our own journal, IBIS, um, you'll see this um, has got a score of 325. And if you do look down the left hand column underneath the outmetric ring, 
you can clearly see that we've got a few news outlets picked up but tweeters are by far the, the most prominent user um, of this paper and we've got 439 tweets of 20, 291 users um, and that basically works out that between the author one of the authors of the article and ourselves we contributed a third of the overall outmetric score for this paper and when i say we've contributed what i do there is from our original tweet you can then track the retweets so most most of the tweets on here are retweets of either the tweets that we've put out or the author has put out and similarly this is an interesting one where someone who came onto twitter several years ago and actually didn't have a good experience with it decided to come back onto twitter last year to promote a new research paper on, on a species which is considered extinct before she started doing it she actually came to me and asked whether or not she should and i said certainly there's a self-made community there for you um, and she she started tweeting and she's contributed 40 percent of her own paper's twitter contribution so that's one author just um, on her own work providing 40 percent of the outmetric score this example here shows you how as a publishing society we don't just promote um, work from our own journal we promote the research articles in any ontological journal around the world and um, this one we've contributed 85 percent of the overall twitter score 50 percent of facebook and a blog and we know from research into all the top journals that we that uh, are in our sector that the BOU as a society as a society actually contributes between 55 and 95 percent of Twitter out metrics for those individual journals. We can also demonstrate how this works for societies. So a society over in the UK, the RSPB, in 2013 they undertook um, an independent review of their science. This review rated their science as excellent as outstanding but one of the criticisms that the reviewer reviewing panel made was that nobody knew about it they weren't talking about their research so working with the bou the rspb's um, social media team um, started a proactive campaign of twitter and blogging in order to increase the mean outmetric score of the um, research articles so we saw an immediate impact. So the two bars on the two blue bars on the right hand side, you can see that they've clearly grown from 2013 and then two years on, they've grown again. So this has been a clear indication where a society has identified that they've not been driving the visibility of their own articles. And they back in 2013, they didn't know any means to measure that visibility. Outmetric has provided a means for them to actually measure the performance of all their social media campaigns around their own research. So one of the things that we've done in our community is we very quickly established a tag on Twitter, Ornithology, and you can see here on this graph along the bottom the, the growth of that tag both in users and, and general impressions. And we do events like Twitter conferences, so we did one last year um, we had 68 presenters, over a thousand contributors, over 3,000 audience. Now that is much, much larger than any face-to-face -face event that we could ever do. Um, and of course, the benefit of using social media um, is that it's more inclusive. You've got contributors and, contributors and participants from all around the world. And of course, the carbon footprint of Twitter conferences is negligible compared to a face-to-face -face conference. So I'm now going to quickly have a look at the links between what we've what we've done in ornithology linking out metrics and citations and it's back to the paper that i did with finch and o'hanlon last year and a subset of papers in particular that looked at um papers that were cited in 2015 and 2016 that were published in 2014. the main thing to look at is the top part of this uh item on your left and this shows the steady increase of the mean outmetric attention score over time from 2012 to 2016 which is no surprise given that during that time social media itself has increased dramatically in the research sector but also um, it also gives you the fact that the more recent um, publications are attaining a higher mean score simply because um, social media is instant 
and you find most of the score happens within a week of a publication of an article. We can also drill down the data and we can look at the um, the use or the, where the scores come from different scoring streams. So if you look in the lower part of this uh, graph on your left, um, where you've got the platforms, Twitter, news, blogging and Facebook, and that uh, the, along the bottom are the individual journals. And you can see that different journals will use different platforms more widely than others. So ourselves, we use Twitter is, is, is our main focus and we, we're relatively low on the news articles, whereas some of the others like the Orc are very good at getting their uh, research articles into the news. They actually use an agency, whereas we don't. Um, so there are ways that you can manipulate all of these different scoring streams as a society or as a journal. So this, we linked the sites, we looked at the probable uh, citations and the citation counts of the research articles published in 2014 and cited in 2015 and 2016. And both of these show you that low impact journals have more to gain. So the purple bars in both of these graphs are on the low impact journals and you can see that they've got more to gain than the higher scoring journals. And basically, we had a mean impact factor amongst these journals that we looked at of 1.84. Um, so you can see there that the citation rate was up for all of these journals and the probability increased by 7%. So one of the things that we've driven, um, how we've driven our social media presence is um, by having this static content as well as the social media presence. And I said before about providing a one stop shop for people to come to. So we have this one uh, page that collates all of our activity, all of our papers and poster presentations. We have a series of blogs on, on the society working for our author community. We have our Twitter masterclass series. And we have other social media articles that we ourselves have published. We have other resources on the website that link wider and externally um, to other resources around the web, in particular social media um, research papers. But it's important, I feel, that you're um, you're seen within your community and don't just be seen as a, a journal or as a society um, Personalize as much as possible you as an individual or gets individuals within your journal community or your, your society um, To front up and personalize your presence within your community Speak to your community as a community member and develop your own voice and your own tone to, to suit your audience This takes a little bit of time it took me about a year before I before I felt confident in how I was actually communicating all this to my own community. And build both your personal relationship and your society relationship within your community. And that itself will help build your personal and society reputations. So this is our one stop shop. If you want to make a note of the website, um, I should have said at the start, I've actually you'll find my on my own Twitter feed, which is Steve Dudley underscore. Um, at three o'clock, I did a tweet linking to a, a fig share of this presentation, which you'll find on, online to look at later. And lastly, I'd just like to thank my research colleagues and my tweeting bird colleagues who helped me with social media presence around the world. And again, thanks Cat and Outmetric uh, for this afternoon. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thanks very much, Steve. Your um, your presentations are always so in-depth, but always fascinating. Um, I will just try and take control of the screen back. I have to. I have a big long list of people I have to scroll through every time I do this, and then it says me somewhere. Um, so please do keep sending your questions in. Um, I will try and get through as many as I can just now. Um, you can hopefully just see my question slide now. Um, so, Steve and Phaedra, are you ready? Yes. <clears throat> okay, um, I'll start with one that's coming um, for you, Phaedra, actually. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that you got more return on investment on Facebook than on Twitter. Um, do you have any sense of whether this was just for your journal, um, for other journals in your company, or do you think it's across the board, or scientific or medical journals? 
Well, you know, it, it's a good question. The statistics uh, that I quoted directly relate to the referrer base from those particular outlets back to our journal website. So it is specific to the Aesthetic Surgery Journal, but I wouldn't be surprised to, to learn, it, if we were to dig a little deeper, that it would relate to the STM, uh, Scientific, Technical, and Medical Publishing spectrum of journals. And, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for Twitter and engagement. Um, and it was higher a few years ago, but because of the drop, like I said, we've turned our focus to Facebook. Okay, um, another question that's come up that's kind of related actually is, um, do you, and perhaps you could each speak to this, so do you have individual Twitter and Facebook accounts for each of your journals? Um, or do you use a kind of shared page across your organization or is it both? How do you manage that? Um, Steve, I go first. We, we have one presence across the internet, although the society is the BOU, all of our social media presence is labeled um, or identified as Ibis Journal. And um, we only have the one journal. Um, but since that is our core presence within the society, within the community, and um, we decided to let that be our tag within the community and it doesn't it doesn't appear to have done us any harm in in having the society step back in that respect and we also have our own separate facebook and twitter account that the journal has set up and manages but we're the official publication of our society which is the american society for aesthetic plastic surgery they have their own press and media team and their own handles etc so we do work collaboratively but we both manage our own respective um, pages okay that's interesting to kind of just hear how you manage the logistics of it um, Wendy here has had a couple of technical questions, which I'll just kind of try and quickly answer. Um, so she's asked on social media, do you need to use a DOI um, for the attention to be tracked? Um, this is a question we get quite a lot, um, certainly for Altmetric to pick up the mention. We don't need you to use the DOI in your actual post. We need you to link to a page that has the DOI in the metadata. Um, and we'd be happy to provide uh, more information about what kind of metadata tags we need to be able to link the attention to the research. Um, if you ever have any questions, please do write into our support desk. Um, you can use this email address that you see on screen here. Um, Wendy has also asked about um, whether or not we track the conversation. Um, I don't know how many people are on the call are familiar with it, but the, the conversation is a um, online initiative um, typically regional, so there's one in Australia, there's one in the UK, um, where academics are invited um, in conjunction with their universities to publish um, pieces on their area of expertise. So the idea is that it helps connect, you know, the experts um, to the more general public in a, in a way that can be more easily understood. Um, so in terms of actually tracking the conversation, Wendy, we track mentions um, of, say, published research articles from the conversation. So if an academic writes an article and then they reference a research article, we'll pick that up. But we also track attention to the conversation articles. Um, so if your authors or, or your researchers are publishing in the conversation within Altmetric, certainly within our Explorer database, you can see the attention um, that those actual conversation articles have received themselves. Um, Audrey has asked uh, whether or not we have any suggestions for how academic publishers that mostly publish books rather than journals might use Altmetrics. Um, Stephen Fager, do you, I don't know if either of you have worked on books at all, would you have anything to comment? Sorry, I have no experience of, of book publishing in that respect. Yeah, the focus of my career has been in journals as well, and I do have some experience uh, helping friends and, and that sort of thing, but I wouldn't want to uh, speak as a, okay. an opinion on it. Okay, no worries. Um, Audrey, I'm not uh, quite sure the angle of your question. Certainly we um, can provide altmetrics for books. Um, we can do it at the ISBN, at the book level, um, or at the chapter level, if your chapters have DOIs. Um, typically, uh, we've seen people like MIT Press and Michigan Publishing integrating altmetrics for books already. Um, they are really interested to look at the syllabi data in particular. Um, so they've been quite surprised in some cases to see where books that they assumed were, you know, just kind of part of their, their backlist um, are still really popular today. Um, I think another really useful thing is internal uses. Um, so when your um, commissioning editors are looking for new authors or perhaps people to contribute chapters to books on a specific topic, um, that can be a really good way to find new people to write. 
Um, again, we'd be happy to chat with you, of course, in a lot more detail about this. Um, I'll just move on now because we've got quite a few questions in. Um, a question for Steve. Um, you mentioned that Instagram is the fastest growing social media platform for science. Um, where did you get that stat? Was it from research or, or was it just kind of a, a feeling or? No, that, that's, that's not my own stat. Um, that was someone, there was a conversation around this on Twitter um, about a year or 18 months ago. Um, and it was, it was on the back of that that we then researched going on to Instagram. Um, I, think, I think what you've got to be aware there is that um, the conversation that was on Twitter also highlighted the fact that Instagram was, was starting from a fa effectively zero um, output from scientists on it. So as soon as scientists moved over to that platform, you were going to see a rapid rise. The, the Twitter and Facebook were already had large scientific communities. So in comparison at the time, the, the growth there is going to be less. Um, but people, there's still a lot of a lot of scientists moving over to Instagram. A lot of societies and journals are moving over there as well. Um, we, we find it quite limited ourselves, um, unlike our other platforms where we share content from across avian science. Um, on Instagram, we only tend to share um, articles and news stories from the society itself. And it's, it's less um, engaging, there's less interaction. Um, and of course, there's, there's no um, hot links going to outside um, sites on the web. And of course, it doesn't contribute to our metric. OK, thanks, Steve. Um, Phaedra, there's a question for you here. Um, you mentioned that um, you know, people can think of social media as a networking event. Um, so on that note, what are your thoughts on live tweeting events or otherwise using social media as a way of attending or participating in real life events? Um, have you found, do you do much of that and have you found that that kind of activity gets a lot of engagement? So, you know, um, it, it's a great question. I really do appreciate that coming in. So we don't do a lot, a lot of us in, in my particular role, a lot of us that work on this journal work from home. So we're not in the office where we would have an opportunity to do that on a daily basis. But I think that it's really great and can and should be used during conferences and when you're together, similar to how people are using Facebook Live. But I think it needs to be well thought out and targeted and short, a minute or two at most. Um, I think that's really where you're going to get the most engagement, interest, and, and effectiveness. Okay, and then uh, this might have to be our last one. I'm really sorry if we haven't managed to get to your questions, um, but perhaps you could both add a comment on this. Um, the questions come in, could you speak more to how you engage your authors or editors to post or tweet about their articles once they were published? Did you write the post for them or did you give them a template or, you know, kind of, how did you drive that engagement and how much success did you have? Um, if I go first, um, we, we wrote blogs about it. Um, so we had content on our static site. And then as soon as an author has an article accepted with us, um, it's, we have some information in the acceptance letter, but that tends to be long and full of technical stuff. Um, so what happened is a couple of days after the acceptance letter, we send an individual personalized email to them pointing yeah. out the various social media resources that we have on our site and encouraging them to blog about their research to start with. Um, and then we encourage them to post on Facebook and tweet on Twitter. And I think that's that just hooked into into our community. And we've, we've done that for about three, four years now. And we use this really technical strategy called GILT. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but we do, we talk a lot about it with our authors. We developed two groups of people on our editorial board. So we developed this group called the Next Generation Editors, which are young up and comers and also social media ambassadors. And so these are people that have great technical and social media acumen. They're young, they're interested, they're you know kind of climbing their professional ladders. So um, we'll tweet out an article and we'll reach out to these two groups of you know about 10 or so people. So right there, we're reaching out to about 20 people saying, hey, this is an important article, let's all retweet it. Sometimes I will write the posts, I will pick the images for them. Sometimes um, I'll just give them suggestions or talking points. And I find that the best is when they take what we've offered but sort of put their own twist or voice or style onto it and then push it forward. And again, I think I mentioned earlier generational gaps. Um, you know, some generations just aren't going to engage on Twitter, but those that do, 
you know, they're using animated GIFs, they're uploading video clips, um, they're using Jiffy and other, you know, kind of um, uh, apps that can really sort of make their post pop and stand out. So, um, you know, we encourage and we try and teach whether it's one on one at meetings or whether it's at editorial board meetings, we try and show and teach all the tools we have to make their presentations better. Okay. Great tips there, thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid I think we're gonna to have to leave it there for today because we are at uh, time. Um, for the people of us, it was recorded, so we'll certainly send a link around. Um, we'll try to make the slides available. Um, I think we might actually try to pull together a little bit of an FAQ based on the questions you've asked um, because I'd love to be able to give you all a response. Um, so thank you all for being such an engaged audience. Um, and thanks very much to you, Phaedra, and Steve for such brilliant presentations. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All right. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks for tuning in.